Now we're going to open up with the law. So we can turn our Bibles to Exodus, the 20th chapter. We're going to open up a verse 1 through 7. Exodus 20, 1 through 7. When you get there, brother, you can go ahead and read Exodus 20 and 1. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heavens above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters underneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down himself nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou should not take thy name, thou should not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the seventh the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, nor thy, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea and all that is in, all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is in thy neighbor's, that is thy neighbor's. All right, okay, let's go ahead to Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter. And we're gonna pick it up at verse 13. Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. If you get that, buddy, you can go ahead and read. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, whether it with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. All right. <clears throat> and let's turn over to Revelation, the last chapter, book of the Bible, Revelation 22. We're going to pick it up at verse 14. Revelation is 22. And we're going to pick it up at verse 14. You can go ahead and read. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates unto the city. For without are dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever love, love it, and make it a lie. That's right, sisters and brothers. So as we see, the, the Lord gave us the commandments. He gave us everything we had to do as far as the whole duty of man. And then he gave us the uh, results for keeping those commandments. Is what our reward is going to be, and that is everlasting life. That's what we are working for. So happy Sabbath to everyone in the crowd. My name is Brother Torrance, and my reader today is Brother Carl. Carl? Yes, sir. Brother Carl. I'm sorry. Got a lot going on. I was about to call you Brother James. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But uh, my name is Brother Torrance, and uh, the reader is Brother Carl. And today, the title of today's lesson is The Covenant with Death. The Covenant with Death, disannulled by Jesus' blood. And I want to touch on this topic because a lot of people don't talk about it. You know, death in general. You know, the community that we come among, uh, apart don't really deal with talking about death and preparing ourselves for the things to come. You know, uh, most people believe that once you die, some people believe that once you die, it's just over with. Go to the grave, that's just it. Some people believe that once you die, you're going to heaven. But these type of topics come up in, well, let me, let me digress a little bit. It's the covenant, we want to talk about death, but we want to talk about the covenant that man made with death and how we made that covenant with death that started in the Garden of Eden. When the first creation, we're gonna go into Genesis and walk that down, but many pastors nowadays, even the Lord called them false prophets, 
have made uh, babies and discriminately lied about some of the things that would uh, thus say the Lord. Basically, lying to everyone. And some of the lies they tell you is, like I said, you're going to heaven. And that will lead to another lie that they can build upon, which is you don't have to do no works. So you got one lie, you're going to heaven. The second lie, you don't have to do no works, which is keeping the commandments, which we just read was the whole duty of man. Then, which in turn set the people up to inherit the judgment that was set forth for Satan and his angels, right? Or Satan and the fallen angels, because they all work for God, regardless if they holy or if they uh, unrighteous, right? So the Bible teaches us about life, and it teaches us about death. And the Lord told us to choose life and live. But death was chosen rather than life. The Lord outlined that to Jeremiah. Death was chosen rather than life. But life is an option. You got a choice. You don't have to choose this life that God got for you. You can choose the death and have your reward right now in the street. And you're going to get what the reward of the wicked is when it's all said and done. So you can have your pleasure now, and you're going to get your reward later. Just like Satan is having his pleasure now, but his reward and his judgment is already set in stone. So uh, most people don't understand the significance of Jesus Christ, him coming and dying for the sins of the whole world. Don't understand the significance of that blood that we are up under right now. They don't know why. They don't even understand how we got into a covenant with death. And all of this is by way of false teaching by false prophets. So we come to clear this all up today and set straight the word of God because we have to work for something, and that is for our salvation. But the sin that Adam committed in the Garden of Eden passed upon all men, which gave us all condemnation to death until that blood that was covered, that we're covered under right now. So first thing we're going to do is outline what sin is in the Bible, because pe most people think that sin is smoking and drinking and going and gambling and things like that, which I won't say smoking and drinking is the best thing in the world for our bodies, but it's not sin against God. What we're going to find out is what Lord, the Lord has written in his word concerning what sin is. So let's open up our Bibles to 1 John, the third chapter. 1 John, we're going to go right into the New Testament because it's, it's kind of beautiful that the Lord put it in the New Testament because the false prophets or the pastors always want to take away this law that we just read in the Old Testament that we are bound to. So let's go to 1 John 3. And let's pick it up in verse uh, 4. 1 John 3 and 4. When you get there, brother, you can go ahead and read. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law. Mm -hmm. For sin is, trans is the transgression of the law. So the law that God established to Moses in the beginning, which was the Ten Commandments, he said, whosoever committed sin, you transgress the law. Because sin is the transgression of the law. That means you went against it. You broke it. Keep on going. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Uh-huh. So we're going to find out who that he was that was manifested to come and take away our sin. But in him there was no sin. Go ahead. Whosoever abided in him sinneth not. Uh-huh. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So if, he, if you abide in him, you don't sin because his word is inside of you. So that's what's going to commit commit us not to sin like we had read, I mean like the, uh, the, the, the song was saying, order my steps. So the commandments are our light that's supposed to order our steps. Go ahead. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. So the Lord put life and death on the table right now. He said, don't let no man deceive you. He said, many false prophets are going to come in my name deceiving many. So he said, he that doeth righteousness even as he is righteous, even as he is righteous, this he we're going to outline, go ahead. He that committed sin uh -huh. is of the devil, uh -huh. for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he may destroy the works of the devil. So that's why the Son of God was brought forth, or Jesus the Christ was brought forth, because he had to disannul this sin or this covenant of death by his blood because he was the only one that was sin free. Now we pretty much can close the Bible up, but we're going to go through this whole lesson, all 50 verses of it, and then we're going to get out of here about 5 o'clock. So y'all ready? <laughs> because I'm about to get started right now. now. Let's go to the beginning of this Bible and walk it down. Let's go to Genesis, the second chapter, the start of the creation of man. And let's walk this down because this is how 
we made the covenant with death. Started with Adam and Eve in the garden, and people are still dying under that same agreement that they made with death. So Genesis 2, let's pick it up at verse 7. You can go ahead and read. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground uh -huh. and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Uh -huh. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. So the Lord said he, he gathered the Lord. The Lord uh, 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 had some angels create man out the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Not the soul is inside of you and you all are all educated. Most of this is for the people who are online looking at us and understand that there is no soul inside of you. You are the whole you are the soul. All right. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So the Lord said out of the ground made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight. So we had it made. We were supposed to just go through the garden, take care of it, eat and live and be married. But it was also two things that he likened as trees, but there were actually people, which was Jesus the Christ, was he was on earth with us in the Garden of Eden, and Satan the devil, which was a fallen angel, which is an evil angel in the Garden of Eden along with us. And the Lord gave us a commandment, direct commandment, and this is where we're going to find out how, this is how we fell into the covenant with death by directly rejecting the commandment that the Lord put forth. So he said, these two trees are in the garden. You can eat all the other trees, but this one particular tree I want you to stay away from because that's the one I'm dealing with. He down there for a reason. Let's skip down to verse 15 and pick it up. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Uh huh. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Uh -huh. But of the tree of knowledge and good of evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now you can look at Genesis the fifth chapter and notice that Adam didn't die that same day because he lived like 130 years or like what, 930 years. So if he said the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. It was a spiritual death. We got rejected or pushed away from the Lord at that particular time if we would have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because we would have rejected the direct commandment that God put forth for us to stay away from that tree because it wasn't good for food. So let's skip down to verse uh, 22. You can go ahead and, and, and oh, hold on, my bad. Skip down to verse... Uh, well, we at 15 20, and 17. 20. Yep, you're right. Skip down to verse 20. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help me for him. So while Adam naming all the animals, he's sitting around looking funny because he don't have no mate for himself. So he's like, wow, I'm naming. He got a mate. He's a woman, you know, a female mate right there, a female mate right there. I'm sitting around by myself. So it, the Lord looked at that and said, okay, what did he say? And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. Uh-huh. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So that should tell you right there, brothers, period, that this woman come from us. And we should reverence the woman just like we reverence ourselves. So we should take care of the woman just like we take care of ourselves because she came from us. And the Lord did that for a reason because it's supposed to be built under one family. This is supposed to show a unity. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So now Adam even named the woman because she was taken out of man, and now for what? Verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So it looks like the same thing like the family of God in heaven. They both are together. So this thing is starting with flesh and blood to show us how that we have to have a relationship together in a family-oriented mindset, and it starts with our, our, uh, the husband and the wife, right? Then the children. So
So now let's go ahead to verse, I mean, uh, Genesis third chapter. So now we got this man and we have this woman and they're all in the Garden of Eden. Now we're going to find out how did Satan intervene in the creation. Go ahead. Now the, serpent, okay. now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. Uh -huh. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, have God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So Satan was sitting there listening to when the commandments was given to Adam. And this serpent, you can go in Ezekiel, the 28th chapter. You can go into Revelations, the uh, 12th chapter. You can get all of Satan's titles. You can tie them two together and understand that this serpent is Satan the devil. This serpent is, also, serpent is also that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? So he said, yeah, have God said you should not eat of every tree of the garden? Absolutely, because he was sitting there listening. But what happened? Go ahead. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree, trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you should not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So she knew exactly what her marching orders were. She said exactly what the Lord said and added a little bit more. God said, you should not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. So she knew the consequences of her actions, right? What's, no, what's verse number four? And the serpent said unto the woman, he should not surely die. Uh-huh, directly contradicted the Lord, because he is a liar. Verse 5. For God doeth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye should be, and shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And so, my question to her, and by her desire is, why would you want to even know evil? I mean, the good is the, the part that you want to know, because that's going to lead to salvation, that's going to lead to life. But he said that it was a tree that was desired, and it knew good and evil, and we should have stayed away from that tree. That evil is what she desired, because we're going to see when she make her decision and what happened as a consequence of that decision. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, uh -huh. and that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She desired it. That's the thing. If your desires ain't aligned with the Lord's desires, sometimes they can find, you will find yourself in a bad situation. So make sure that we pray before we make decisions. We pray and let the ark go before us. We pray and let the Lord lead and guide us. Because that's what we always ask in his Lord's prayer. So go ahead. He said the desire, it was a tree that to be desired to make one wise. And what did she do? She took of the fruit thereof uh -huh. and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So you know how they say misery love company, because she knew she drew right. the mission. Right. So she's going to take it back to her husband and tell her all the stuff that, <laughs> you know, that Satan gave, gave to her. Right. The good and the evil. What a shame, because she knew the consequences of it, because she told Satan what the consequences of eating of that tree was. Let's skip down to verse 8, because this is how I'm going to prove the Lord was with us in the Garden of Eden. Go ahead. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Uh -huh. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Uh -huh. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So now they understood something that they wasn't even prepared to understand the nakedness that they were under. And what caused them to really be naked was the sin that they committed. Because when we commit sins, sisters and brothers, we are naked before the Lord. And he calls us alien to him. That means we, he don't even recognize us when we out there doing wrong or unrighteousness. So he said, and the Lord called him to Adam, and he said, I, was, I hid myself because I was afraid I was naked. Babies don't do that, do they? No. All right, so we understand when they were born, before they got that information from Satan, they were like babies mentally. Right. But as soon as Satan gave them all the information, their eyes were opened up, and now they understood something that made them shame. Because we won't walk around naked nowadays, because it makes you shame, right? right. Come right. on, keep on going. And I hid myself, and he said, who told thee that thou was naked? So it wasn't an apple that they ate? No. That, that's the lie that these false prophets put you up under? It's an apple? He said, who told thee that thou was naked? And I really don't understand how people call themselves Bible Christians, and they don't go in here and see that it was not an apple right. after all these generations of people in this world. 
But go ahead and read. Hast thou eaten up the tree whereof I commanded thee, thou shouldest not, shouldest not eat? Uh huh. And then, and the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Threw the woman under the bus. So he ain't going right. down by herself. He shoes. She came to him saying, hey, look what Satan gave me. And right. he dealt the cards right, right back at her. Well, the woman you gave me did this. Right. So now they shooting at each other. <laughs> like a husband and wife nowadays, boy. They be at the house going at each other's necks over something stupid. And that's mostly because Satan get in between. And when he gets in between us, God can't even intervene. So that's what it shows you right now. Don't let Satan get in between that woman and that man. So go ahead. We well, said the woman, the, the serpent beget. Oh, no, we at verse 13. Go ahead. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. So she bounces it back to Satan. Now, the Lord gave everybody they, they, uh, they, they judgment, right? He gave the woman, uh, the, the, in her, during her conception, she has the pains in childbirth. He said, Satan, you're going to be uh, bound on the chains of darkness. So you can't pop up in front of this flesh and blood no more because they weak. But then he gave the real judgment down to Adam, and we're going to see why. Verse 17. And, the, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Men, are we going through that? That is for sure. Women, do you go through that? Because you were taken from man. So you got to work, we got to work. Unless you're blessed enough to have a husband that can go get all the bread. Because if you don't, it's going to take two. And nowadays, the cost of living is so high, we got to have two incomes. So he said, curse this the ground for thy sake in sorrow. I don't like to work. So yes, when I go punch the clock, I'm mad. <laughs> so in sorrow. <laughs> Right. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Go ahead. Thorns also, and thistle shall it bring forth. So it ain't going to be no fruit just coming up out the ground. It ain't going to be pouring over and, and just running over. My cup runneth over like all the false people talk about. Right. Oh, Lord, bless me so much. My cup just running over. My cup don't run over. Because I hustle for this every day. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth. Go ahead. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Uh-huh. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, uh -huh. for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. So after you work all these years, Adam, till thou return to the ground. Right. No heaven was ever mentioned, and this is still the beginning of the Bible. So we know already that Satan wove a bad fabric in the fabric that the Lord was putting together. Well, the God was putting together, Satan wove in lies. And he made you believe nowadays that you're going to heaven. And he said, from out of it was thou taken, and to it thou shalt return. So then what, the, what, what did that tell you? That when we made that covenant with death, we got pushed away from the Lord. Go ahead to verse 22. And the Lord God said, behold, the man has become one of us. To know good and evil. So Satan didn't lie about that part, right? Because the Lord right. created evil. So he said, man has become as one of us. All we got to do now is get back on the right side because we know a lot now. And once we get our mind cleaned up, we gonna be, the body going to be just like God. And we're going to see that as we unpack this lesson. So he said, man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, least he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So this is the thing that people overlook. When the Lord put us away from the tree of, of life, we were taken away from the opportunity to live forever. And now we got to toil and fight and go through all of this to get back what we walked away from that was given to us. And it's just like that nowadays. Our kids reject everything we give them because they think they know everything. And then when they finally look up and they come back and say, Mama and Daddy, you was right. When we go back to the Lord, we're going to be like, yes, you were right. right. Sorry. And we should be doing that right now over our hearts and our minds just telling God how sorrowful we are, even for the sins that Adam committed and to keep us away from that. 
because the judgment of the, uh, of the wicked is going to be the lake of fire. And we're going to read that, sisters and brothers. So he said, therefore, he sent them forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. Verse 24. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden cherubim and a flaming sword, which, he turned, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So now we got excommunicated, pushed away. We can't deal with the Lord. We can't talk to the Lord. We are in our sins at this point, and we're in a garden of Eden. So now we're in the garden now because the whole land is the vineyard of the Lord. And some of us are still pushed away because of the thoughts of our mind. We can't dwell with the Lord. He can't dwell with wickedness. He's not going to dwell in your mind with this righteous word if you got a lot of wickedness tied up in your mind as well. That's why the Lord said to come about this world and to move from her because the lies of this world will get you into condemnation. Right. And let's go see what Adam and Eve, what, or Eve actually took up because we know that Satan is the father of it. Right. Let's go to Hosea, the, third, the tenth chapter, and pick it up because these false prophets are still lying under the clause of God and what thus say the Lord. So what does Hosea the 10th chapter say? You can go ahead and read when you get there. Ye have plowed wickedness, uh -huh. ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou did it, did it, didst trust in the, thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. So he said you have plowed wickedness. When you rejected me, that's exactly what you did. And now, because that was what your work was and the seeds that you was planting, you have eaten the fruit of lies. And now you got to be bound to that covenant that you agreed to. This is what the covenant was. You said that whatever Satan said, we going to do because we like the fact that he gave us the good and the evil. Because when you out there in the world, most people enjoy it. And they can't tell me they don't. But see, they don't understand that that reward for what Satan put out there, that evil that he got out here that's distracting a lot of people, is what's going to get them put in the same judgment that he is, the category of burning and gnashing your teeth forever. That should scare yeah, everyone yeah. because everybody that was born was gonna, is going to live forever. But you're going to either be on the good side of the kingdom or you're going to be on the bad side of the kingdom. But you're going to live forever. And that's why it's important to understand that death is an important topic to talk about. Because how you die is subsequently how you're going to live it forever. Right. So now let's go on to uh, uh, um, Isaiah 66 because these false prophets, they still out here. Satan is still on earth and he got the false prophets still putting stack in the wall that they have built from the beginning with lies on top of lies on top of lies. And the reason why I know that is because people are still going against God's dietary law and these are some of the things that he put in place that we have to live by. Right. So why do I know this? Isaiah 66 and 17 because their judgment is in the future. Go ahead. Isaiah 66 and 17. What, did, what, is, what does it say? They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst. That's what Adam and Eve did, right? Yes, they hid behind the trees. They sanctified themselves. They said that we're going to understand what Satan got, the, the, the desire to eat, the desire to knowledge of good and evil. We want that. So they, they sanctified themselves and purified themselves in the garden behind what? Go ahead. One tree in the midst. Behind one tree in the midst doing what? Eating swine's flesh. So they said they can pray over the eating, right? Right. That ain't what the book say. So wait a minute. The Old Testament is saying you can't eat swine's flesh. Am I correct? Right. So he said that they're going to do what? Eating swine's flesh. And the abomination, the mouth shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. So when the Lord return, all those lawbreakers are going to get consumed with Satan. Right. That's what he's saying. All the fallen angels and all the lawbreakers are going to get consumed together. So if you eating on your baby back ribs <laughs> and your swine, which is the same thing as pork, you're going to get consumed with the one who gave you the dietary law and said you can pray over it and eat it. Those are Satan laws. Right. That ain't what God said. God said, thou shalt not. These are the beasts that are clean, 
And these that I be said are not clean. In Leviticus 11 chapter, you better go read it if you're out there eating swine's flesh. Because he said, you stand behind that one tree in the midst, you're going to be consumed with Satan. And then Eve's desire of the tree to make one wise was the first mistake. And the engagement with Satan was how we started to build that covenant with death, to, to, to initiate the covenant with death. But let's see who it really fell on, and that shows you the importance that man have to walk in righteousness every day because it all falls on the head. Romans, the fifth chapter, let's pick it up at verse six. That's just the hierarchy of the Lord. First is the father, then it's the son, then it's man, then it's wife, then it's the children. Well, and it's all unified. Where we at? Romans 5 and 12. Yeah, Romans 5. Yep. yep. Romans 5. And let's pick it up at verse 12. Romans 5. And let's pick it up at verse 12. Let's see who it all fell on. Eve was deceived. But what happened? Verse 12. You go ahead and read. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world. So by one man sin entered into the world. Uh-huh. And death by sin. Uh-huh. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So when Adam sinned, he was the first man that was created. Because he broke the because God gave Adam the commandment directly. Eve heard and was taught by Adam through his mouth. But Adam had the commandment directly, so he is the one who the Lord is holding his feet to the fire. Because right. honestly, brothers, if we walk right, our wives will, if we are righteous, our wives will fall in line with what we say, because they're going to line you up with the word of God. If you ain't walking righteous, trust me, these sisters are smart enough to sit up here and say, nah, brother, we ain't going that way. I don't care what you're talking about. But if you're walking in the word of God, these sisters will fall in line because it's their duty. They have a job, too to make sure the house is in order. Because if the house is in order, the man and the wife are in sync. It's a relationship that we have to take on. So he said, by, by, by one man's sin, it, uh, by one man's sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and it's passed upon all. Go ahead. Verse 14, oh, skip down to verse 14. 17. No, I want you to skip down to verse 14 real quick. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So even though we weren't in the garden of Eden and we didn't sin, like Adam sinned, broke the first commandment, the death was passed upon all men. The condemnation was on all of us because man sinned. And when God's look down on the earth, they see man. They don't see nothing else. Right. But I'm going to show you how they're going to see you. Got to get up under that blood. And that's how we're going to be seen by God in righteousness. Now let's skip down to verse 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Uh -huh. Much more, they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. That's right. So now by one sin, death reigned by one. It's all on all of us. But much more, we have received that abundance of grace, which is a free gift. And we, we get this free gift by keeping God's law. We didn't work for the gift. He gave it to us. He don't have to kill us all. So he said by one, uh, he said grace, he said uh, we have received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Did I cut you off? No. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I didn't cut that part off. You didn't read it because I do cut you people off sometimes and I'll be apologizing okay. for that. So he said now, he said now this, this righteousness shall reign in life. That's what this God that we serve is. He is pro-life. He's not about death. He never want to see people that's human and flesh die. Right. He said he wish all the sinners repent because he don't have pleasure in the death of the wicked. He don't want to see us die. He created us. Go ahead. Verse 17. 18. I mean, my bad. 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one judge of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Uh-huh. Even so, by the righteousness of one, 
the free gift came upon all men unto justification of uh -huh. life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Mm -hmm. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And see, there's one. One man brought it in. One man had to take it out. But the one man that took it out was clean. Wasn't no more Moses. Wasn't nothing else that came. No more bulls and no ghosts that was holding us off until this one man came. And it says, therefore, as by one offense, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. We was not going to get off from under the death sentence until Jesus came. That one man who was righteous, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men. It's a justification of life. Now we got this free gift that we didn't work for. Everybody got access to it. And all you got to do is what? Fear God and keep his commandments. Well, that's what we read in the opening of the law. Right. So Adam sin brung death. And when he broke the commandments in the when he broke the commandments in the garden, we basically said we made lives our refuge. Right. We hid behind that one tree in the midst. And let's go see what the Lord had written in Isaiah 28th chapter. Isaiah 28. And we're going to pick it up in verse 15. Isaiah 28 and 15. Because we cannot continue to live under the agreement that Adam and Eve did thousands of years ago when we have access now back to the tree of life. I can understand if we were still walking around and didn't have access. I still probably couldn't even understand that. But the fact of the matter is we have access to the tree of life, so we should not live no more under sin or behind that one tree in the midst. So now let's go on to Isaiah 28 and 15, and let's pick it up whenever you get there, brother. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death and with hell, are we at agreement? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. So you told, well, Satan had y'all so comfortable because you made a covenant with death by rejecting God's uh, straight, direct commandment, right. Right? right? And he said, well, hell, now we made an agreement. So now I say the condition is going to be that lake of fire that was reserved for Satan and his angels, right? He, and then you talk about when overflowing scourge, it ain't going to touch us. We are sanctified. We good. What did the Lord say? For we have made lies our refuge, and, also, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Uh -huh. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, that he that believeth shall not make haste. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And the hell shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters shall overflow the hiding place. Because when the Lord come back, it will not be nowhere you can hide. Hmm. No lies is going to protect you, and you will not be able to go to the Lord and say, Satan said it like they kept on passing the buck in Genesis. He said, when I come back, if you still up under that tree, if you still want to make that covenant with lies, and you still want to make them lies your refuge, when I come through here, it won't be no stone unturned that I'm not going to touch. And your judgment is right. going to be the judgment of the wicked. Right. 17? 18. 18, go ahead. And your covenant with death shall be disannual, disannulled. Yes, sir. And, and your agreement with hell shall not stand. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by it. So if you don't get up under the blood of Jesus, then your covenant with death will not be disannulled. You will still be in it when he returns. If you don't find yourself doing the steps that we put into this lesson to get cleaned up, when he returns, you're going to, what did he say? When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, then ye shall be trodden down by right. it. Right. That means you will not escape this judgment if you don't get under this blood of Jesus. And how do we know how to get in the blood, we're going to start walking down the way we can get ourselves cleaned up. Because Christ died for all of us that we may have access to the tree of life and then receive eternal redemption. So let's go to Romans, the fifth chapter. Let's go to Romans, the fifth chapter. Because he said, your covenant with death, I'm going to disannul. 
And how is he going to do it? Romans 5, and we're going to pick it up at verse 6. This is how the Lord is going to disannul that covenant with death. These are the steps we're going to have to take and to pay attention to so we can see the strength in the blood of the creator. And yes, Jesus did create all things, and by him are all things. Romans 5 and verse 6, let's go. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So we were out without strength because we sinned, right? So sin, when we were out without strength, when we were sinned, Christ came and he died for all the ungodly. Go ahead, verse 8. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So now while we walked around and was thinking that we were all good and we made them lives our refuge, Christ already had the plan to come and die for all of our sins. And he gave us little schoolmasters like the, uh, the, the animal sacrifice and stuff like that to keep us in check. But man would seem to make a sin, go and do it again, and sacrifice another animal, and do it again, and sacrifice another animal. Well, if you keep on sacrificing your animals, you're going to be poor. Just like nowadays, you keep on sinning, I guarantee your pockets be hurting. Right. I guarantee it. And then you're going to look around and wonder why your money ain't flowing the way it's supposed to. Then you're going to figure out, oh, man. Oh, I've been stealing time from the job. That's why your money ain't coming through, because Johnny been stealing time, so you thought it was okay to steal time, too. Just really simple ways that we can get ourselves caught up in this world. Everybody is victim of it, because it's so easy, because, uh, like they say, the thin line between love and hate is a real thin line when the Lord loves you, and then a mistake you can make, and then he will hate you. And his hate is strong. So that's why we got to focus on this blood and stay up under it. Where we at? Verse 9. Verse 9? Verse. Hmm? Let's go ahead and read. I don't even know where yet. Much more than <laughs> being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So go ahead. Much more than being For justified by his blood, we shall be saved through wrath, from wrath through him because we up under that blood now. Right. So now when that overscour that, uh, 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 that, pa that overscourging pat uh, that, that water go through, I said right. just that simple. Right. When that pain, when that judgment come through, we should be protected. We're going to be saved from the wrath through him. Go ahead. Four, if when we were in enemies, we were re reconciled to God by, we were, we by were reconciled, the death. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Uh-huh. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So said when we were enemies, when we were sinners, right, when we was walking around, in ignorance, sinning, even today. God, blood was there for us to get up under. For all that time, we were trying to get ourselves together. The grace was there too. And he was giving us time and time. Because all of us that sit before, all of you that sit before me to get today, I know how to, a, a path that you walked in, it wasn't always righteous. So that God's grace was over all of us. That's how merciful the God that we serve is. His grace was over us until we got ourselves together. And now, thank God, we are serving him on his Sabbath day. Right. So he said, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That sounds like two gods right there, don't it? Right. So much for that oneness theology. Much more being reconciled, we should be saved by his life. So that means he had to come up out the grave, didn't right. he? Because he died. Right. Okay. And verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So now, when Christ died, we received the atonement, and we should joy through our Lord Jesus Christ. When did the atonement happen? We're going to walk that down. But we have to do something right now. It's important for us to pay attention to what we have to do right now to get and stay up under that blood and up under that grace. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Because we received the atonement by his death, and we were reconciled to the Father by the death of his Son. And let's walk down a few things, little action items that we have to initiate 
and to continue until the second coming of his son. First Corinthians, the fifth chapter, and we're going to point, we're going to uh, uh, pick it up at verse seven, because he said, we have received the atonement. And I'm questioning when. Let's put it on the table. Verse 7, 1 Corinthians, 5, 5th chapter. And let's pick it up at verse 7. Go ahead. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our pastor, Passover is sacrificed for us. So he's saying, purge, therefore, out the old sin, that you may be a new lump. We're going to see how you can purge out that sin. Through that baptism, sisters and brothers, we get up under that blood. He said, purge it out and don't sin no more. For Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. That's when he made the atonement for our sins at the Passover. Them set, that, that one action liberated us in one instance and then also gave us access back to the tree of life in another instance. But it was all about being liberated or the curse of death being lifted off, off of us by the atonement. And also the covering of the blood liberating us from being in captivity. Not only captivity in general, but captivity to the death that was put on the table in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Let's walk that thought down. That seven, you hit eight? Next Go ahead. Hit eight. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, uh -huh. neither with the leaven of malice and with wicked and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So now what he's saying is once we purge out that old leaven, let that blood that's covering us, the Passover or the atonement blood that's covering us, let's keep it unleavened. We're supposed to be able to do this seven, six, seven thousand years. We're supposed to be able to keep ourselves from sin because that's what God gave us. So every year, we're supposed to be able to go before the Lord unleavened. We won't drop, we're going to drop the ball, but that's why we have access back to the tree of life so that we can ask God to forgive us for that sin. And let's, let us not do repetitive sins like it's the same thing over and over again. He's merciful to forgive us. And all that come to him in righteousness and truth, he will forgive, because he don't want to see none die. So he said, purge out that old leaven. Get up under my blood, because Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Let's go walk down. Let's go into Exodus. Let's go back to the beginning a little bit and see a representation of this blood and how it liberated Israel then. Exodus 12, and we're going to see what was some of these names that was called, because everyone got to understand also that Jesus was called, he had multiple roles. He's the Lion of Judah. He was the Lamb of God. He has a lot of roles, and we're going to walk it down, and we're going to see a couple of them today. Exodus 12, and let's pick it up at verse 1. Go ahead and read. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. So the Lord commanded Israel to take this lamb according to the house a lamb for a house. And we're going to see what that lamb is and what it represents. Verse 6. And ye shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Uh huh. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Uh huh. And they shall take of the blood and strike it, strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house, houses where. Oh, wherein they shall eat it. So the Lord gave them direct commandments. He said, you take this lamb, you put this lamb up, and you kill it on a particular day. All that has very much significance that we're not going to cover today. That's another lesson. And if I go down that lane, I'm going to be here for five hours. So let me just focus on what's important. He said, you're going to take that blood, and you got to do exactly what he said. He said, strike it on the two side posts, and on the upper door posts, wherein ye shall eat the lamb, 
Let's skip down to verse 12. Go ahead and read. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborns in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. Uh huh. I am the Lord. Go and, ahead. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where, where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So when I see the blood of the lamb, I'm going to pass over you. I'm going to set you free. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to let that death angel come in your house and kill you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's what Jesus said in Isaiah 61st chapter that he right. came to do. He came to get that to set us at liberty, to free us, the, the captives from slavery. Right. We were enslaved to sin. We was in bondage to it. So the blood compasses more than what we just think. That blood of Jesus has power. And it's supposed to set us free from sin. Liberate us. Like it's liberating Israel right now. Protecting them from the evil angel. So he said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Go ahead. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you. When I smite the land of Egypt. So when the overscoring, when the overflowing scourge come through the land in the future, it's going to pass over us that's under the blood. That blood of the lamb. And how I know that this is talking about Jesus, let's go into John the first chapter. Because the spirit of prophecy, the, test, the, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. We should understand who the old book is talking about all the time. Jesus had many roles. And John, first, this John, John they came to pass, not the first John, just regular John, right, just right, regular right. John. John came to pave the way. He, made, he came to make straight the way of the Lord. He came to tell everybody that it's somebody coming who I can't even deal with. I, he came, he, he, he's referred before me because he was before me. Tell him the whole story because it seems like people nowadays don't understand that the Old Testament it's the spirit of prophecy, and that's talking all about Jesus Christ. And these false prophets don't know how to tie together the scriptures to make sure that their congregation understands that. In fact, they have a doctrine called Peterism that they say that the Old Testament is done away with. No. But we just read that they covered their houses with the blood, right? Right. Now let's go see what John, uh, the blood of who? The lamb, correct? Yes. All right, now let's tie it together. What did John call Jesus when he seen him? John 1, and we're going to start at verse 29. John 1 and 29. Go ahead and read. The next day, John see, seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the, whole, of the world. So he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. So this lamb that was in, e in, in, in Egypt in the book of Exodus was just a precursor or a representation of the Lamb of God, which is none other than Jesus Christ, who came to take away the sins of the world. And what did he do first? Back up to verse 11, because this is exactly what he did because he had to come and jumpstart the priest to get them back on their ball so they can go back and tell the whole world what thus said the Lord. So verse 11, go ahead. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Many of us still don't receive him, but? But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So now we understand what the promise is. He said, but as many as received him to them, he gave them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So not only do you have to hold fast up under the blood, you got to call on a proper name. And he told you in Malachi, he said, by the rising of the sun and the going down the same, my name should be great among Gentiles, right. which are Europeans. And they don't call on Yahawashah. They don't call on Yahlarashah. I don't know how to pronounce them all. <laughs> But one thing I know that I do know is they call on the name of Jesus Christ. Right. Even in the movies, they say Jesus. When they're in trouble, it's all about Jesus. And then these people who stand in front of you, some of our Hebrew brothers, will tell you that that name is something that our slave owners gave us. 
but it's also the name that Jesus gave us to identify who he was in the New Testament and the name that he wanted to come in. He came in his father's name. And that's what they fell in to realize. That wasn't his name. He said, by my name, Jehovah, your father didn't even know me. Right. He's Jehovah, the son of God, the right. lamb, the lion. Right. And I can go down about five more and give you five more names. Because this whole book is about Jesus. That lamb that we walk through and we disannul and reject. Because he came unto us on and his own received him not. Where we at? That was the end of it? Yes, sir. All right, let's go into Isaiah the 59th chapter. Isaiah the 59th chapter. Let's walk down some more of the how he was going to disannul this covenant with blood. Because don't think that they didn't agree on this in the, in the heavens. And then they came, and uh, it came into an agreement. The Bible says he took sweet counsel together with his father. And they came to the agreement that who became known as the son had to come down here and die for the sins of this man. What nobody else, the blood of bulls and goats wasn't going to do it. So what did the Lord say? Isaiah 53, where we at? Isaiah, I'm sorry, Isaiah 59 and verse 15. Isaiah 59 and verse 15. Go ahead. Yeah, true fell it. And he that departed from evil maketh himself, make himself a prey. Uh -huh. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercession. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him. So it wasn't a Moses then. He looking down on the earth like man has destroyed themselves. He said every imagination of our mind was wicked continually. It was evil continually. Mm -hmm. So he said that, he said, yeah, truth faileth, and he departed from iniquity make himself a prey. And I'm sure half the people in this room understand that because when you sit up here and say you serve the true and living God, people look at you and like, what God? Is there anything, right. is, there, is there any truth in that? Right. There's no truth in the Bible. They don't want to believe it because of all the false doctrine, all the bad lies that has been, been told in the name of God. So he said this, the, the true fella, and he's a part of even make himself a prayer, and the Lord saw it. And it displeased them that there was no judgment. judgment. You know what the judgment is? You know what the, thus said the Lord? That's what the judgment is. He said, you do this, this is going to be the consequence of it. We know the judgments of the Lord. But he said, in that period, no one understood it. So then, verse 16. And his righteousness. It's no, no, a, starting oh, start verse again. 16. And he, and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Uh-huh. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, uh -huh. and his righteousness, it sustained him. Who is this him? This is talking about the father, sisters and brothers. Mm -hmm. So he's saying he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Where was no, there was no more Moses. No one else is dying. No more blood, bulls, and goats. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained the father from destroying the whole creation. Go ahead. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate. As we should. Go ahead. And a helmet of salvation upon his head. Sound like the arm of the Lord, right? The, the whole arm of the Lord, right? Go ahead. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. And those vengeance, he said the, the garments of vengeance for clothing is when he come back that second time. And it's time to destroy all the workers of iniquity. He said it's going to be so much blood that it's going to reach up to the horse's brow. So I'm assuming it's that. It must be a class bell, too, because it's got to be a lot of blood seeing how many people that's on this earth that's going to die. And they don't believe that Jesus is going to come back and kill. Right. They think that he's sweet and he's cuddly. And he is merciful and gracious. But he do not play when it comes down to the keeping of his commandments. And so, when we are in a household, we don't play if our kids break the rules of the house. It's right. the same thing. We have to look at it physical, then we have to look at the spiritual side of it. And the Lord setting all the physical up with us and our hierarchies in the household to show us. We set rules, and we want everybody to abide by them. God set rules. This is his house, the earth, and he wants everybody to abide by it. And right. it could be P, 
peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Right. Like they talk about all Christmas Eve. <laughs> but then they <laughs> rob you all Christmas Eve. Then they hit you another day and go on holiday right, right after Christmas. Right. They killing us. So look, the Bible said that salvation, he said, therefore his arm brought salvation unto him. Let's go see what this arm is. Let's go to Luke the second chapter. Luke the second chapter. We're going to pick it up at verse 25. Because as I said before, it seems like nowadays people don't understand nothing about what thus say the Lord because one major reason is the false prophets teach people that the Old Testament is done away with. They teach them this, and now we don't look for God. So now we're going to Luke the second chapter. Luke the second chapter. Because the people in the Bible in God's day understood the prophecy of the scriptures. That's why they were looking for things. That's why the wise men were looking for the star. Right? right? And they would say, right. oh, we saw a star in heaven and we came to worship. That's when they went before Herod. So they had knowledge of the prophecy of his coming. So now, when the consolation came, right. let's go see what one of the brothers that knew who Jesus was, what did he say? Luke, the second chapter. Because remember, it said his arm brought salvation to him. Arm brought salvation. Luke 2, let's pick it up at verse 25. 2 and 25. Let's see what Simeon got to say. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. So he doing the same thing that the wise men was doing, right? right. They all waiting for this consolation. They all waiting for the sign of the Messiah. They understood the prophecy of the scriptures. So he's sitting there waiting. Go ahead. And it, was, and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Uh-huh. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the customs of the law. Because then you had to have that son, man, child, circumcised on the eighth day. So he came. And he was told by the Holy Ghost that he shouldn't see death until he's seen the Lord Christ. Now, we just read that his arm will bring salvation. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do the, for him after the custom of the circus, I mean, after the custom of the law, go ahead. Then took him up in his arms and blessed God and said. What did he say? Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. So now I can die. Why? According to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. I have seen thy arm, Lord. This is who you sent forth, who John was talking about, the lamb. Behold the lamb which come to take away the sins of the world. Simeon understood that too. That's why he said, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. The same arm that the Lord was talking about in Isaiah that's going to bring salvation. And his name was what? Jesus Christ. That's the blood. That's the salvation that we got to get up under. Because if we don't, we will be condemned. And if you don't believe Luke, because I told you the, the testimony of Jesus Christ in the spirit of prophecy, let's go on to prophecy and show we can show the world that it all ties together. Isaiah 53. Let's show them that it all ties together. You can't have one without the other. Because the Old Testament is nothing but the Old Covenant. Right. The New Testament is just the New Covenant. This is the new agreement we're up under. And we're going to show you that. A lot of our Hebrew brothers don't want to teach you that we are under the New Covenant because they don't want to bring in these nations that are going to come with us. So let's go to Isaiah 53, and let's see who this arm is again. Isaiah 53, pick it up at verse 1. Go who, ahead. Who have believed our report? Uh-huh. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Pretty much nobody, because they don't even understand who the arm of the Lord is. Go ahead. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Uh-huh. And as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form no com nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we shall desire him. So that's just telling you that Jesus had to spring up out of Israel, because we don't drive bones in the valley. 
So he had to come up out of Judah, particularly because he was a Jew. Right. So he said, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He didn't come to win a beauty contest. He came to give us what the father gave him. Go ahead. He is despised and rejected of men. Uh huh. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Didn't we read that in John that he came unto us all and his own received him not? Right. So he is despised and rejected of men. He said a man of sorrows because he knew that he had to come and die for the sins of the world. He's not happy about that. If I got to go to jail for my kids, I am not going to be happy. Right, right. <laughs> I do the bit, but I'm not going to be happy. Right. So I'm going to be a man of sorrows acquainted with grief because we did something. We hid our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Go ahead. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Just like they said, Job, right? They tried to, man, you must have sinned or something. That's why you're going through all the stuff you're going through. Jesus went through the same thing. They just kept on rejecting him. Something wrong, man. We don't want to mess with you. He said, they said, stand over there because we are holy. We sanctified ourselves under that one tree in the midst of the God. And when the Holy One of Israel came, we rejected him. Go ahead. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Uh huh. He was bruised for our iniquities. And chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. So now we can be able to come back to the Lord. Because with his stripes, we are healed. Because what? Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. Uh huh. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him in the iniquity of all, of, hold on, iniquity of us all. So the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all because in Isaiah the 50, now we saw that no man was able to take on all of this, right? Right. So now it should be connecting pretty well. Well, now it wasn't a man that could take on all these sins. No more blood of bulls and goats going to take it away for you. So now we got to put it on Jesus. And all with his stripes we are healed because all of us as sheep, soon as they smoked the shepherd, they went crazy and we were all going astray. Even today, we still, as a human race, have not all submitted or subjugated ourselves unto Jesus. So, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He said, with his righteousness, the fathers were sustained, right? right. The father was sustained by his righteousness. Let's go to verse 10, and let's see what it say. Go ahead and read. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased him to bruise him. Go ahead. He had put him to grief. Where thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. So we got to make his soul an offering for sin. Go ahead. He shall see his seed. Uh-huh. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So when they agreed and Jesus had to come down, they said it pleased the Lord to bruise him. The father, because he said, I got to send my arm to save them. Right. He said, yeah, put him to grief. And he said, well, thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. This is the way we get out from under that covenant with death, by making Jesus' soul an offering for sin. Well, now let's go into Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and see what Paul says to them Hebrews about this same account. And they said the Old Testament is done away with. I can't see how. We're going to go to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and we're going to walk that down. We're still walking down this arm that the Father had to sin to die for the sins of the world. Hebrews 10, and we're going to pick it up in verse 4. Hebrews 10 and 4. Go ahead. And when you get there, brother, you can go ahead and read. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Uh-huh. 
Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he say, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but, but a body hast thou prepared. But we just read and Isaiah said they made a soul an offering for sin, right? Right. right. But we see now it's saying his body, which really puts together that the soul and the body are one. And he said, under the old covenant, he said it's not possible the blood bulls and of goats should take away sin. Right. I mean, they had ordinances that wasn't good for them. He had wrote that, I think it's Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. He said he gave them over to ordinances that wasn't good for them. Animal sacrifice was never going to take us away from sin. So he said, a body hast thou prepared me. Go ahead. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then, mm -hmm. then said I, lo, I come in a volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. So he's Jesus saying, I come in a volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. We are commanded to do the same thing. We are commanded to use Jesus as our example to do the Father's will. Because he came down and spoke nothing but what thus said the Father. Right. So he said, it is written of me. What? The volume of the book. Like I told you, sisters and brothers, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. This whole book is about Jesus, his blood, his people, how to get us back on our square, and then the redemption of the whole world. Go ahead. Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering, offering and, and burnt offering and offering for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither has pleasure therein, which are of offered by the law. Uh -huh. Then said he, lo, I come to do the will, thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, uh, he taketh away the first, uh -huh. that he may establish the second. So he took away the first covenant that had offerings and, um, and, and ordinances right. of bu blood, of bulls and goats that could take away sin. He took that away and offered himself for the sin. Mm. That's why he said, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He take away the first that he may establish the second, and under the second covenant, so many beautiful things come up under it, which is the salvation for all nations, all those that call on the name of Jesus Christ in truth and in righteousness. So verse 10, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So he said we are sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Everyone. And let's go walk that down and prove that it is literally all people who call on the name of Jesus Christ and believe that he is the son of God have faith. And if you walk in that faith, you will get the same reward that Abraham gave. Right. Get. Because right. what well, Abraham will get. Because the blood of Jesus was retro, and when he died, it covered everybody from, a, a, uh, from Adam all the way forward, even to our son, sons, and to the coming of our Lord. If we walk in righteousness, we are protected. As long as we walk in faith, believing and knowing that God is true. Go ahead, verse 26, Galatians 3 and 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Uh-huh. So it said he died for the sins of all, right? All. So this blood justified anyone who want to come up under it. It's not just for the Hebrews, even though it was written in Hebrews. Jesus came and died and offered his body for sin for all. Once for all, that we, by faith, are now called the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Go ahead, verse 27. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So now that you've purged yourself from this old leaven that we read about, that old sin, you got in the water, you got baptized, now you put on Christ. Now you just said what Abraham, I mean, the um, Israelites said in the old time, all that you said, Lord, we will do. Right. So now you're supposed to be clean for seven days. Go ahead. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Uh -huh. There is neither bond 
nor free. This is all, right? This is what the all who comes up under the blood get. There is neither Jew nor Greek, my Hebrew brothers. There is neither bond nor free. Go ahead. There is neither male nor female. Uh-huh. For ye all, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. So now we are all one in Christ Jesus by faith and what? Verse 29. And if ye be Christ's, then ye are ye Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. And heirs according to the promise of the resurrection to life. Let's go into Revelation, the seventh chapter, and walk that down. Because he said he died for the sins one time for all. Now we see that if you have faith in Jesus Christ, knowing that he was the son of God, there's neither Jew, there's neither Greek. But you are all in Christ Jesus and if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And we're going to see what that heirs look like. Because when Christ came up out of that grave, he was all God. Was nothing left. That's what we're looking for. That's the promise. So now where, where we at? Revelation 7? Yes, sir. And let's pick it up at verse 9. We just bagging that fact up that all will be in that kingdom that call on God in righteousness and in truth. This ain't just for the Hebrews. This is for everybody. Revelation 7, and pick it up in verse 9. Go ahead and read. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, uh -huh. of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb. So that Lamb popped up again? This is the same lamb that they sacrificed all the way in Egypt and put the blood over their doorpost, over their altar. That's the same lamb. So he said, after this, I behold a great multitude which no man could number of all nations. Sisters and brothers, Israel is just one. Right. That means all the sons of Noah who called on him in righteousness and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb, what was on them? Clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. White robes represent the righteousness of the saints. So of all of these different nations outside of Israel included, got on all of this white, that mean we ain't going to a, bar, a peach party or a boat party. Right. We're going into the kingdom of God. Like they right. sung this morning, we're going home to Jerusalem. Yeah. All right. That's what we're fighting for, sisters and brothers, to get back to our land, to get back to our rightful position in this world. Where God set us up, we failed. But we now have an opportunity to get up under that blood and get back. Right. And what verse 10 say? And cry with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb. Again, sounds like more than one God there. The right. Father and the Son. And when the Son was resurrected, where did he go sit? On the throne. Right. So that means that if we get heirs to the promise, where are we going to sit? On a throne. And only people that sit on thrones, sisters and brothers, are kings. So we will all be kings and queens if the queens make sense. I don't know if God got women, but, you know, they all gods. You understand what I'm saying? There no, ain't no variance. It's not a male nor female. No Jew nor Greek. We're going to all be one. We're going to all be God sitting on thrones. And how do we get to be able to get, become God and sitting on thrones? Let's go to Matthew, the 19th chapter, and see what the Lord told the young man to tell you that even though you're coming up under this new covenant, you still got to do one thing. 19 and 16. If you want to sit on these thrones, and this is in the New Testament, too, for all my New Testament Christians. 19 and 16, go ahead and read. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I might have eternal life? Uh -huh. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So if you want this life that I'm out extending to everyone, do something simple. Just keep the commandments. Walk in my statutes, my laws, and my judgments, and you will receive eternal life. 
Skip down to verse 27. Go ahead and read. Because then Peter came with a question. Right. And what it was the answer. Let's go see the question and the answer. Go ahead and read. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? So we separated ourselves from the world. We didn't sanctify ourselves behind one tree. We have separated ourselves from the world and we are following you. That's what we're supposed to do now. All of my sisters and brothers on television, whether you're black, white, Asian, or African, it does not matter. We got to forsake all and we have to follow after Jesus Christ. And what shall we have therefore if we do that? 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So now he promised us to sit on twelve thrones. He promised us all that come up in the regeneration that follow him. We should sit upon thrones, judge in the twelve tribes of Israel. Verse 29. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, uh -huh. or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. That's the promise, brothers and sisters. We got to keep on beating at home. That's what we're working for. And man, make it so hard to believe it. These are just words from God that's telling man, if you do this, I promise you, I'm going to give you eternal life. I know it looks kind of crazy right now in the world that y'all live in, but if you hold fast, I got you. The check coming. Right. We going to get it. You ain't got to go far either. All you got to do is stay in your living room and read. And then understand the judgments of the Lord. So he set us free, and then he gave us the commandments still, and he told us to keep them. And now we understand why he told us to purge out the leaven, because let's go to Zechariah the ninth chapter, because he is coming back. Right. And he's coming back to get all those that separated themselves from the world, rejected mother, rejected father, said the world doesn't mean nothing the way it's running right now. Because honestly, the way the world runs right now, I wouldn't want to live forever in it. And that's the truth. So Zechariah, the ninth chapter, let's see what the Lord has Zechariah right. Let's see if we all saying the same thing from the beginning, Genesis, all the way to the end. So go ahead, Zechariah 9, and pick it up at verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Uh-huh. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Uh-huh. Behold, my kingdom cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So he said, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. He said his arm brought salvation. The arm of the Lord was the only thing that was going to disannul this covenant with death. He said he is just and having salvation. Who came in riding on an ass? A donkey. Jesus. Right. right. That's how we know we're talking about the Lord. Go ahead. And this is a future thing in the Old Testament since it's done away with. Go ahead. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. Uh -huh. And the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the, heal to uh, the, heathen? To the heathen. And his dominion shall be from sea even to sea. And from the river even to the ends of the earth. Not, not from heaven to heaven. No. Not from like the east of the heaven to the west of the heaven. No, no he said from sea to sea, from river even to the no. ends of the earth. No. It's the Lord's salvation going to go through this land. That's why it's going to go through it like water. You won't be able to hide from it. Right. Go ahead. As for thee also by the blood, by thy, uh, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. So he said, as for thee, by the blood of thy covenant, I have set forth thy prisoners out of a pit. If you in a pit where there is no water, you are going to die. Yes, sir. So he said, I set you free from death. Not only the, the, sec the second death is what he's talking about, because we, uh, we're going to read, it's appointed unto men to die once. 
Right. Because of that covenant that they made, death didn't get taken off the table for us to die the first one, right. but the second one is what we're trying to dodge. Because this first one, all of them, the prophets of old were telling us, put me in the grave because I want to hide from the time to come. All of us are standing here nowadays because we're strong enough to get through this period of time, hopefully. And we're going to see the salvation of the Lord with our own eyes in this generation. Go ahead. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Uh huh. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. So his salvation is his second coming is on its way. Because since the Lord walked the earth, he kept on saying it is the end. He kept on saying it was the end in that time. Right. How much farther, I mean, how much closer to the end can we be a thousand or two thousand years later? Right. Let's go to Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Hebrews 9, let's pick it up at verse 11. Because his second coming is close, and by the blood of his covenant, by the blood of thy covenant, he has set forth the prisoners when there was a pit with no water. Hebrews 9, and let's see what Paul says. Pick it up at verse 9. When you get there, go ahead and read. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, uh -huh. that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once unto the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So it's no more he got to come and die again. It's eternal. For whoever want to get up on it, it's going to live now life eternally with him. If you want to get under this blood, verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sacrifice to the purifying of the flesh, uh -huh. how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God. So he said, if the blood and bulls and of goats was able to clean you, the ordinance I put you up under was able for me to pass over you and keep on ignoring your ignorance. He said, now that God has came and he died, how much more of an opportunity we have now to get back to the tree of life? Because right. the blood of bulls and goats couldn't get us there. Right. So he said, without, he said uh, he, Christ offered himself without spot to God and he said, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And how do you serve him? By his law. Right. That was Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Let's rock it down to Romans, the seventh. Bag it up. Romans, the seventh, because now we can fully understand what Paul talking about when it comes to the dead works. Dead works are the works of the flesh. Things that you find yourself doing that you know. You have no business doing it because your mind should convict you from right. doing it. Right. So now we got the works of the flesh and we got the works of the spirit. Everything spiritual and physical. First is physical, then is spiritual. Romans 7 and 7, go ahead and read. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I have not known sin but by the law. For I have not known lust except the law has said, thou should not covet. So now these false prophets want to teach you that the law was done away with. That's why if you don't have to do no works, then you won't do anything. You won't keep the law and then you think that you're going to get salvation? He said, is the law sin? God forbid. Because I couldn't point out sin except I understood what the law said. Go ahead. But sins taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of Concupiscence, concupiscence. Uh, concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. So there is no law, there was no sin to point it out. So without the law, sin was dead. Go ahead. For I was alive without the law once. Uh huh. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Well, we thought we was alive when we was running those streets. Right. Everybody thought they was having fun. But then when, the, when we came into this truth, we realized we had to change because we were not going to get salvation unless we made a decision to change. Like I said, life is a choice. Right. Death is a decision. You choose death by your actions. You choose life by your actions. Go ahead. 
and the commandment which was ordained to life, uh -huh. I found to be unto death. So now this commandment killed me because I couldn't live up under that flesh no more. So it killed the old man. And now I'm living unto life. Go ahead. Where we at? 12. That's what? Romans, uh, Romans 7, 12. Oh, yeah. Skip down to verse 12. Thank you. Go Where, ahead. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just and good. And this is in the New Testament. Right. Why they telling you a New Testament Christian don't have to be bound by the law of God? Because he did all the works. You see how they can keep on stacking law, lies on top of lies because their father gave it to them? Right. Just like he gave it to them in the Garden of Eden, he's still feeding them people out here with lies. Do no works and watch what your pay going to be. Go to work nowadays and don't <laughs> think you're going to get paid on Friday. This right. is in man's world. Right. Acts the second chapter. We got some action items we got to clear up. Acts 2 and 20, 22. We got some things we have to do on our behalf. He came and he died. He did his job. So now when you find out that you was doing wrong like he was just saying, Paul was just saying, I found out I was doing wrong. The law showed me what sin was. Right. When they found out that they killed Jesus, they got spooked. They were supposed to. Go ahead. Um, Acts 2, pick it up at verse 22. Acts 2, pick it up at verse 22. Go ahead and read. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of them, uh -huh. as ye yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determination, determinate Determined. counsel mm -hmm. and foreknowledge of God, uh -huh. ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. See? And that's what the Lord had to come for. They had set and had sweet counsel together. So he said him being delivered by determinate counsel and for knowledge of God, he knew he had to come and die. Isaiah 61 said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I got to go out here and I got to set these people free from the bondage of sin and death or the covenant that they made with death by dying. And what they did with their wicked hands has crucified and slain him. Go ahead. Whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death uh -huh. because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Because he didn't do no sin, so if you don't do sins, it's not possible the death don't hold on to you either. We're going to be able to shake it off, and we're going to get a new body just like he is. Go ahead. Where we at? 36. Oh, yes. Yeah. Skip down to verse 36. Skip down to verse 36. Go ahead and read. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So now that he had been redeemed, he's been made both Lord and Christ. Go ahead. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And that's what we're trying to tell the world. Now that y'all understand that you got to get into the blood of Jesus, you should understand something to ask this question. What shall I do? Go ahead. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So you have to repent. He said, Purge out the old leaven. He said, Be baptized. That's how you purge it out. That's how you get up under the blood. You have to repent and you have to be baptized. You repent from the most sins that you committed, and once you come up out of that water, you are a new lump. From that day, that's the first day of your life you was ever clean. And I know a lot of us got a couple spots on us from that day forward. Right. But that's okay, because you're still breathing. And a living dog is better than a dead lion. Right. Let's go. Where we at? 39. 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And now we understand that Everyone who was called got opportunity to the promise like he gave to Abraham, which is everlasting life. Right. We're going to do this, right. and we're going to get through it, sisters and brothers, and that's our duty to the Lord 
keep these commandments and get this promise that he gave to faithful Abraham. Stay faithful to him. Right. We're going to be all right. Now let's go on to Romans 6, chapter, verse 1. Romans 6, verse 1. Because now that we understand that this sin, the law, and his grace, the stuff that's covering us and keeping us still breathing, even though we make mistakes, we got to get back on that boat and we got to keep on fighting for faith. Using this faith to keep on fighting that good fight. Romans 6 and 1. Go ahead and read. Romans 6. Pick it up at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid we continue in sin because we are under grace. Go ahead. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So that means the people who talk about you are under grace, you don't have to do no more law, no more commandments, or you don't have to keep the commandments because you're under grace. What did Paul write? Then if you don't keep the commandments, you are bound under sin. Right. So he said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Right. We can't live that are dead to sin. We can't do that. Go ahead. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized unto Jesus Christ, were baptized unto his death? That's what we, the baptism represent, getting baptized unto his death. Go ahead. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, by the glory of our Father, even so we, we also should walk in the newness of life. So when he comes back and redeem us, that's what our promise is. We're going to walk in newness of life. Go ahead. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, uh -huh. we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Uh -huh. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. That's what Paul was talking about. So now I gotta, now that we pointing out what sin is, I have to keep the commandments because that body of sin has been crucified. Right. Now that it came out this water, I need to live clean. Verse 12. Seven. Mm. Oh, you got seven? seven? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. For he that is dead is free from sin. That's right. He that is dead. Physically, this, this, this old man got killed. We freed from sin because we live spiritually. Now skip down to verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, uh -huh. that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Uh -huh. Neither yield ye your members as an instrument of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That's right. We are alive now. Because we have been quickened by his word. We understand what the word of God is telling us to do. 14. For sin shall not have domin dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. So now, sin can't have dominion over us because the Lord gave us the commandment to be dominating in the Genesis anyway. So now that we're under his blood, we should be able to abound over sin much more. Because now we have a confidence. Now we know what we're fighting for. Now we know we don't want to give up this salvation. Get down. I mean, go ahead. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. So now what he's saying is, as long as we are keeping this law, we're not under it. If I stop at the red light, I don't have to worry about a ticket. So long as I keep God's law, I am not bound by it. I am keeping it. And we're still under that grace. But because we're under that grace don't mean we got to break this law. Go ahead. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey. Uh-huh. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Because what? Verse 23. If it's sin unto death, obedience unto righteousness, what does verse 23 say? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Jesus Christ our Lord. So now the wages of sin we understand is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And when he died, this is what he initiated. Let's go on to Hebrews, the ninth chapter, and I only got two more places after this. Hebrews 9, and let's pick it up at verse 15. Hebrews 9, and pick it up at verse 15. When you get there, you can go ahead and read. And for this cause, 
He is the mediator of the New Testament. That's, That's right. right. So because he died, now he's the mediator of the New Testament that what? That by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, that, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So now that blood was retro. So now everyone that come up under his blood, now we have the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. The law of bulls and bulls, and the law of the killing of the bulls and goats couldn't take away the sin. So now we got up under this new testament, which is the blood of Christ, because that's when he came and died in the new testament. So now we're under a new covenant, and he's the mediator of it. Verse 15. 16. Where we at? 16. Go ahead. For where a testament is, there must also be a necessity. Go ahead. Be the death of the testor. testor. Uh huh. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is, it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. So he had to die. The testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, there's no strength at all while the testator lives. Go ahead. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Uh huh. For when Moses had spoken, Every precept to all the people according to the law. Uh -huh. He took the blood of the calf and of goat with water and a scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Uh -huh. Saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. So even like the first covenant was ratified by blood, the second covenant had to be ratified by the blood of Jesus Christ or initiated or enacted. So now we're under the second covenant because of his death. Skip down to verse 24. For, go, go ahead and read. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, uh -huh. which are the fi figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Uh huh. That's no, the way yet. Go ahead. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then was... He often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, once in the end of the world, have appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So he said, but now, once in the end of the world, which is what he was telling y'all before he died, that was the end. 2,000 years later, we got to be much closer. He have appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Go ahead. And as it uh, is appointed unto men once to die, uh -huh. but after this, the judgment. Uh -huh. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So now we are looking for him and he's going to appear the second time. Like the father said, I had to send my arm to bring salvation to these people. So now we're looking for him and that salvation that's promised to us. And we have to walk according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. Therefore, we won't be condemned in Christ. So let's go to Romans 8 chapter and see what Paul is talking about to these Romans again. Romans 8, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. And I got one more place after this. Romans 8, and pick it up at verse 1. You can go ahead and read. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So now he's telling you, you can't walk after the flesh because to be carnally minded is the person who walks after the flesh. But to be spiritually minded is the person who walks after the word of God, because his word is spirit. Right. Go ahead. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. If you sin, if you transgress the law, then you die. That's what he's talking about. There is no law of sin and death. The law is if you transgress, the transgression of a law is sin. Right. Go ahead. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. The law of animal sacrifice could not do because it was weak through the flesh. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. That's right, because he was righteous, and there was no other man when they looked down on earth that was pure enough to die for the sins of the world. Go ahead. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Uh-huh. 
For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Mm -hmm. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Mm -hmm. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Because it's subject to the law of Satan, they still behind that one tree in the midst, eating swine's uh. flesh. And they sanctified themselves behind that tree. That's why they're not subject to the law of God, and neither can they be. Go ahead. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. You have to be in the spirit to please him. Why? Verse 16. The spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's how the Lord knows us. Because we communicate in the same language now. Because the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When he look into our minds and he don't see it polluted, that's my servant. That's why he told him, look at Job. He's right. a perfect and right. upright man. Right. He was perfect and upright because he kept the law of God. Go ahead. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, uh -huh. that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon... Nope, nope, stop huh. right there. So he said, and if children, then heirs. Huh. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. He came, he died, he showed us what it was supposed to be like, and he got back on the right hand of the Father, sitting there waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. That's in Psalms 110. So he is sitting there, and we're going to be joint heirs just like him. That's our reward. Go ahead. For I reckon... That the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Uh -huh. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of, of the sons of God. So now we are waiting for this to be brought forth, this salvation that was sent unto us from the Father. And now let's go to Revelation, the fifth chapter, and let's close it out. Revelation 5. We're going to pick it up at verse 1. Revelations 5, pick it up at verse 1. And when you get there, you can give me one second. I still have a few pages turning. Revelations 5. And go ahead and read. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Oh, hold on. You're on 5 and 1? Five, oh. Yeah, yeah. Revelation right five. Uh -huh. Sorry. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within on the back, uh, on the back side sealed with seven seals. Uh -huh. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look there. They're wrong. wrong. And there is no man in heaven. I think Acts the second chapter tell you that. That even David hadn't ascended up into the heavens. No man has went up into the heavens. Go ahead. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. Uh huh. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So this is the same Jesus that we're talking about, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root. He's the root and the offspring of David, have revealed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Go ahead. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it has been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. That lamb still there, and it had been slain for our sins. Go ahead. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Uh-huh. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odor, which are the prayers of the saints. Uh-huh. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by the blood 
out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Isn't that what it said in Galatians, the third chapter? Yes, sir. That they that are, that if the faith in you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So these people has been redeemed unto God by the blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. And what else? And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So we're not going to heaven, sisters and brothers. We have to get up under the blood of Jesus to be able to inherit this promise of eternal life and salvation. And in order for us to do that, we have to do them action items. We have to repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. We have to go and walk in his law, statutes, and commandments. Once we're baptized, come about that water, do our best to walk the straight and narrow path. So Jesus came and he died to cover us under his blood so he can disannul that covenant with death that we made in the Garden of Eden. And we are waiting for the adoption to with the redemption of our body. And um, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Do you have any announcements?